Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. This is the first of the um, viewers selected spotlights videos. This is a sort of new idea. Spotlight videos as a concept on this channel don't work very well. The people they work for are the people that have actually got the plant in question or, or who are thinking of getting it. And given a lot of the plants I've got, other people probably wouldn't have anyway. Um, they, d they just don't work very well. So this is a new idea. Yourselves, you good viewers, have voted for these. And these are, the, this first video contains the top five. Um, I will do two more going down the list. So there will be two more videos with two more lots of five. By then, we will have got down to plants that either got one or no votes at all. <laughs> and then we'd be back to doing a spotlight that hardly anybody's going to watch. So that's the concept, that's the idea. Um, you have to appreciate that to do a spotlight video and try and impart as much information as possible, I should say information, not necessarily knowledge. A lot of this I've had to look up. I have some notes because I couldn't possibly remember it all as it involves names of orchids I've never heard of and in some cases are going to have a job to pronounce. But that's the objective of a spotlight is to get as much information gathered together about an individual plant. I will say at this point there is nothing in my notes that you couldn't have done it yourselves. <laughs> However, You've got muggins here, not only doing it for one plant, but doing it for five. Now in some cases, some of the information was actually knowledge, because I've had the plants a while and what have you, but um, certainly in the case of hybrids, you know, we've done some work, and hopefully this is uh, going to work okay. Now in the past, when I've been looking at a plant and holding the camera in my hand, people have complained about the wobbliness of it all. So what I propose to do this time is leave the camera on the tripod and move the plants and the plants will be in a relatively stable position. You'll see what I mean when we go in, when we get going. So um, let's get going. Okay this is the top five then. Now we had joint number ones. So two plants got the same number of votes and came top, um, each with nine votes. Now given that many of the plants had no votes and quite a lot, in fact the majority had one vote, to get nine votes was pretty good going. Unfortunately, just because it got the top number of votes doesn't mean to say it's necessarily a good plant, which this one isn't. So. Joint number one was what I call Ivanagara Apple Blossom, which in fact has been reclassified as um, Jack Foliara. You will have to excuse the wind noise. We have um, a yellow weather warning for wind at the moment where I live, and I've waited about seven hours for the rain to stop so that I could start filming. We're going to have to put up with the gusts of wind. It is quite noisy at times and we'll just hope the fence stays up. Right, so this plant is a complex hybrid within the Cattleya Alliance. It's fundamentally a Cattleya type, although obviously not an actual Cattleya by name. Now, the complex hybrid consists of a primary cross crossed with a complex hybrid, and it looks I've done some work, as I said, I've got notes. Um, it looked like somebody specifically went out of their way to find highly fragrant orchids with an unusual fragrance that was still very pleasant, um, hoping to get something, you know, in the final result with an unusual and very good pleasant fragrance. I don't think the work was done to get the bloom looking at what went into it, although some components did. So the um, 
primary cross is Caulalia snowflake. Now a Caulalia is a, a name I hadn't come across. Um, it's going to be one of these new classifications where they've probably taken some Lalias with a certain trait and given them a slightly different name. Or it could be a combination of something else which looking down the list it may well be. So this primary cross is made up of <laughs> God, I can't even say half of these Caulathron I'm going to put these in pop-ups because half of them I can't say Bicornutum so that's a species obviously it's going into a primary cross now this is a warm grower it's found on coasts and um, river ravines and places like that mainly growing on rocks and we're looking at the part of the world, Venezuela, parts of Brazil, that part of the world. Yeah, it is highly fragrant, classed as highly fragrant, so you can sort of see why it was picked. But fundamentally, it's a white flower. It's got some markings on it, but not a lot of colour involved here. And it has a very strange trait. It has an association with ants, and there are often hollow cavities at the base of the pseudo bulbs where these little colonies of ants lived and if there's a reason for this I can't find it <laughs> but that's a you know a, a, a trait of this one and that species is crossed with Lalia albida or albida however you want to say it um, that's a Mexican um, cool growing miniature orchid it's also highly fragrant and requires a winter rest. So what have we got so far then? This primary cross snowflake has got a warm grower that's highly fragrant and grows mainly on rocks. We've now got one that's a Mexican cool growing miniature that's also highly fragrant and prefers a winter rest. The place where this Lalia comes from is very dry in winter. Yeah? So that provides over half of apple blossom those two plants that primary cross and that's crossed with <laughs> a right oh, blimey Ryan Catlianthi orange nugget or at least it's got a sensible name again that is again a complex hybrid in its own right and I'm not going to analyze it you can look it up yourself if you want to but in amongst it there is um, what was Brassavola glauca and Digbiana. I think they're Rhinco lalias now. Nonetheless, fragrant orchids, night fragrant orchids. Why pick on those? If you own an apple blossom, you might find that the fragrance is at its best late afternoon, early evening. And that could be the Rhinocolalias or Brassavolias influence. So that's what went into that lot. <laughs> it's quite a complex little beastie. The net result, I've got the basic form of apple blossom. Um, I'll put the bloom up now so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, if you go on somewhere like Orchid Roots and look up the um, apple blossom, it has many forms and it has some named forms and they can vary quite considerably. There is one that is quite a deep yellow with no other colour in it at all. There's one that's a very deep pink with hardly any yellow at all. So there is quite a variety in the blooms. I've got the basic form which to me quite honestly is the best because it gradates the pinks through to sort of peachy colours and the yellows and the fragrance is absolutely stunning and to me it smells of freesias and they are a very distinctive fragrance. So that one came out at number one. Mine is not a very good plant. Um, it was once and it went downhill when I messed about trying to treat the scale with bleach and messed up the roots and it's been recovering ever since. There are some dead scale on here at the moment. They are dead, I can assure you. <laughs> this is the latest growth that's come up in the middle of the plant. It's, don't, it's not going to get any bigger. That's the best it's going to get. And 
this is only going to recover in full if it now puts up another decent sized growth and gets some more roots going. Because this came up in the middle of the plant, the roots didn't get down into the media. I've had to build the media up to meet the roots to try and get them to grow better. Um, one of the traits of um, this plant that is unusual for a cattleya is this doesn't like high light. It's the thing that I can verify on the grounds that I burnt mine getting it too close to the roof round the other house. Those leaves are long since gone. <laughs> yeah. But most cattleyas are high light orchids. Most lalias are high light orchids. So in amongst here, there's quite a lot of, I mean, um, the Brassavola glauca, if that doesn't get the brightest light ever, it's never going to bloom. So this one, for some reason, doesn't like the bright light. It likes medium to bright light and um, I would suggest keeping it well away from any direct sun. Possibly some early morning sun but, or late afternoon, early evening, something like that. But it doesn't seem to need it to bloom and the leaves will discolour quite easily if it gets too much sun. So that's my version of it. Not very good. It has bloomed. I've owned it a long time. It's in its poorest state now. If you look here, this was something that chewed the plant and it chewed all of the surface off and it then started to degrade badly and I dried it off and stopped it rotting. And that stopped me having to cut the actual growth off, which meant I could keep the two leaves. Not a happy plant, not a healthy plant. It's now a plant that's very difficult to get hold of. Um, obviously recreating that cross would, <laughs> would be rather difficult. Um, you, if you wanted to recreate the cross, you could go to the basic components, which is the orange nugget and the snowflake, and try doing that again and see if it works. But because of the complexity of what goes into orange nugget, the results could be variable and you, and you might not get the fragrance. Yeah, Who knows? Anyway, that was um, a joint top, so I'll just um, switch, switch off and come back on with the next one. That's what we'll do. We'll have, have a little uh, shutdown in between. Okay, and the other joint top, again with nine votes, Dendrobium lindleyi. Um, surprised me, I must admit. Now, I bought this as a small plant, and it bloomed in its first spring early summer, strictly speaking, unexpectedly on what was quite a small plant. And um, the plant grew on quite nicely, but it had to come off of its mount. And then combined with that, we moved house and everything, and it set this plant back. Um, it will grow. Um, I mean, the, the, the couple of new growths it put up last year did put out some roots. Um, so it has got some roots. It's been kept relatively dry through the winter, dry winter rest and all that. But um, being a species, there's a lot less to say about this. <laughs> it's made up of the species. <laughs> so it makes life a lot easier when you're dealing with a species. Now, this takes a life cycle you could say a milder form of how you would treat Dendrobium nobilis, but a milder form. So come springtime, new growth should start. This is when you feed and water well throughout the growing season and get the bulbs as large as you can. It is classed as a single leaf bulb, cane, sorry, Dendrobiums. Um, but I've got a couple with two leaves on which is unusual. I did have one with three once, but they've dropped. It's semi-deciduous, the leaves do drop eventually um, and leave little leafless bulbs, canes. You can see here the seedling canes, these tiny little ones in the center here. That was the original plant there and then gradually it's expanded away from that central point. Yeah. So you can, you can see the progress of that plant. 
The only direction it hasn't done very well in is this one. It's done well out there, out there and out there. It's grown away from the original plant quite well. So um, that's that. Now this, I believe, grows very well on a mount, providing you can keep the humidity and the watering up, and that allows you to give it its dry winter rest quite well. Being on a mount should also allow you to get it up in the roof or somewhere near some glass for its winter rest, because you need to increase the light. So this needs the dry, bright, cooler winter rest. During that rest it can go down to quite low temperatures but I don't recommend it because I don't believe it's necessary. I believe what makes this bloom is the bright winter rest, that bit of it. Also the fact that you're not growing anything, obviously watering needs to be cut down to next to nothing and no feed, but I don't believe it needs the cool element because mine round the other place bloomed very well and it didn't get a cold winter rest because I got heat around the other place in the winter. I don't hear. Um, but then I can't do the bright light as well as I used to be able to do it around the other place. Where this would have been on its mount facing the glass with no shading in direct sun in the winter months. It doesn't get much brighter than that in the UK. But yeah, bright and dry winter rest for this. So. Feed and water through the growing season. You'll know when it's finished growing because there's no more new growths pushing on and the new growths you've got have matured. You can tell when the canes are mature. They look like the ones you've already got. Hopefully a bit bigger <laughs> than the last ones. I mean, you can see if you look at the size of um, this bulb here compared with some of the others, that's the largest bulb on the plant. Well, obviously and that's also the twin leafed one. You know, if you look at these bulbs here, so this bulb is much bigger than those, so you could reasonably assume it's finished growing when the leaf's matured and it's, it's not moving anymore. You have to watch these because come the autumn time when you stop the feed because they've stopped growing, cut the watering right down, try and find a much brighter place to keep it through the winter as much light as possible. While you're doing all that and into the winter rest you will find that your nice plump shiny bulbs that you've grown start to shrivel. Careful because that's not an indication to start watering heavily because they naturally produce the ribbed effect. This is not shriveled. This is their natural state. Yeah? So these bulbs are not shriveled. In fact, they are quite plump. So um, not much more to say about this. Um, it doesn't need bright light to grow. So during the growing season, that doesn't have to have the bright light. It will grow in medium light quite happily. Feed and water well, but don't go mad. Don't give it more water than it can use because the ro roots can rot but they're most likely to rot in the winter time. Now I've started watering this now because I'm trying to get the thing to come back into growth. I don't think I will get any blooms this year, but who knows, it might surprise me. And the reason I don't think I'm gonna get blooms is that I didn't get many new growths last year. The root disturbance coming off the mount, change of environments, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we might get a spike or two. Um, Spikes come out from, they don't come out of the top of the cane, they don't come out of the base of the cane, they come out part way up, basically. Uh, I was going to say, let's see if we can find one. There's, there's a spike there, so if you look at it, it's about halfway up the cane. That's what was, you know, a, a bloom spike once upon a time. Um, that's the only one I can see at the moment. So, yeah, it's not a bad plant, but I do have to go very careful with it, you know. Um, it did grow some roots on some of the new growths. The older roots, when it came off of the mount, died. So I ended up with a plant with hardly any roots. Luckily it grew a few new, a few new canes and those new canes put out some roots. And those are the only roots it's got. So it's a very fragile plant because it hasn't got a thorough good root system covering the whole of the plant. 
the rhizomes of these canes is all connected so it is one plant it's not pieces so any goodness that gets up into the roots it's got can be distributed to the whole plant but it could do with a better root system and um, some good growth this year with any luck so um, not much else to say about that one really um, it's quite temperature tolerant so you know you know your actual environment where you keep it what you would call its growing environment is quite tolerant it doesn't have to be super warm or anything like that um, house temperatures would be okay for it but it might object to low humidity um, it, it does come from places that are relatively uh, relatively humid and those places are starting off in Assam and going right across to parts of China and practically everywhere in between you could safely say it's common as muck <laughs> in as much as it's found in many 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 countries and parts of countries so basically the Far East um, and it lives in the dendrobium section Densiflora um, what else lives in that section that you might know oh, I can't think of anything at the moment anyway so that that was joint top so now we'll go on to uh, effectively what is number three because we've uh, we had joint tops okay so third with eight votes so only one behind the other two is dendrobium roy tokenaga and um, why on earth people voted for this i really don't know my idea is that it was the latoria type that they could remember <laughs> And as a Latoria type, mine is a poor example. We have old useless canes. These orange shriveled canes are doing the plant no good at all. They need to come off. So this whole section at the back needs to come off. Possibly this one as well. They're draining the plant because the plant, any nutrients, nourishment that this plant's taking on board it's still trying to share amongst the whole plant and any that gets into these is a waste of time then they're, they're non-supportive um, now this plant is on the high priority list to get repotted um, it got put in a clay pot which was my fancy idea to stop it staying wet in the winter these roots will rot as easy as anything during winter months without heat yeah and I don't have the heat in the winter months so that was my idea and it sort of worked but it's now not working on the grounds that the latest growth here is not hydrating this is flimsy it's not getting enough moisture in in fact I think it might even be rotting this cane feels soft and it shouldn't do so we might have to even lose the latest growth. It desperately needs repotting and the roots getting into some media that will hydrate the plant. It's got a good base to it, a nice solid base. So providing I can get a new growth to push up, losing this one, yeah, I'm not happy with that. That is quite soggy. I think we ought to take that off. It's never looked good, that cane. <laughs> and that might trigger a new growth from the base. There's plenty of places the new growth could come from here and here on the base of those canes so the idea of the um, holy clay pot was good in theory but in practice it didn't work it also meant that the roots stayed on the surface hardly anything went down in the pot and I suspect most of the reason is that the clay pot um, produces evaporative clay um, cooling when it's um, watered the um, function of the evaporation from the clay cools down the media and that's the last thing a Latoria type needs. Right, so Dendrobium Roy Tokenaga. Um, it is in fact a primary cross, so there's only two species involved, so we can have a chat about the two species. <laughs> this is quite fun. Um, we've got Dendrobium atroviolaceum this is a warm to hot growing plant that comes from rainforests. 
Do you think my environment is conducive to a warm to hot growing rainforest dweller? So this is daytime temperatures in the growing season of 27, 28, 29 and 70 to 80 percent humidity. Does that sound like my environment? No. <laughs> so it's not going to do well here yet. I haven't finished yet. This is just one part. Um, now this is one that um, has very fragrant long-lasting flowers. Um, it's said that it likes a bit less water in winter. The areas where it come fr comes from do, do dry up a bit in the winter, but they're not true dry periods. The Latoria types, all the Latoria types come from the same region, which is like Papua New Guinea and the surrounding islands. These are tropical islands, but some of them are mountainous. And as soon as you start putting elevation, you can get snow on a mountain cap on the equator. Yeah? So it's just because, you know, these are, um, you know, equatorial type islands doesn't mean they're all boiling hot. They are at sea level, yes, but they might not be higher up the mountains. However, this one is, is a lower grower and it's a warm to hot grower. So that's one half of what went into it. And the other half is Dendrobium johnsonii. Now this is a bit more temperature tolerant. Um, so you've now got a warm to hot grower and one that will is found at different elevations so can grow in cooler temperatures. Nonetheless, not cool. Just cooler than warm to hot. So you could say that averaging these two brings it down to the top end of intermediate which I'd be happy to say that's a good environment to grow this in. Um, nonetheless, my plant's not very good. Um, both these plants provide fragrance and long-lasting blooms. The combination of the two is an attractive bloom. I had one once that did bloom a long time ago and I lost that one. This was a replacement and it has yet to bloom and it's not going to unless I can get some strength into the plant. The strength will come from multiple growths with leaves that stay on and don't drop. Plus a repot, plus removing that back half of the plant. And hopefully this branching root system, which stopped growing, it looked brilliant when it started, and then all the branches, just the ends dried up. Now I'm hoping that by getting this in some moister media these will start to grow again and start getting some oomph back into the plant and hopefully at least one, preferably two or even three new growths to fire up and then that will put the strength back in the plant. But I'm probably never going to get this plant to grow well because of its need for heat. Now, the other thing with Latoria types. These places where it grows, we get a wet and a dry season, don't we? Or drier, I wouldn't say a dry season at all. Does it get cold? No. That's the difference with the Latoria types. They are happy with a constant temperature throughout the year. And if you can keep these warm, like 25 degrees plus, yeah? they will grow constantly and will become very good, strong, healthy plants. They need that heat. You can dry them off a little bit in the winter time, but the other thing is you're coming from equatorial countries, day length, 11 to 13 hours, light intensity, bright. Can we do that in the UK in the winter time? No. So why I've got Latoria types, I don't know. Uh, I think this had something to do with, um, you know, it did bloom for me a long, long time ago and I really like the blooms. Unlikely to do it again at the moment, not on this plant, it's too weak. And this bulb has got to come off. That feels like liquid inside there. I will investigate by taking the casing of the cane off and see what's inside. But nonetheless, it's on the list for a repot.
So that generalization with Latoria types, you can basically accept for most Latoria types. They like to be warm. They will grow continuously given an opportunity to do so, although they will be slower with the reduction of feed and water in the winter time, but not a reduction in temperature. So that's their, their winter rest is nothing more than just withholding feed and water to a degree. They still shouldn't totally dry out for anything more than the shortest period of time. So uh, not like your nobilies from that point of view. So that's that one, that was number three, third on the list. Right, so number four. I've had to move the tripod back for this one. It's a biggie. Um, Oncidium shari baby. I'll say it again. Oncidium shari baby. Not sherry baby. There's no E in it. Shari baby. And um, basically this is made up of three component Oncidiums. Um, but a fair bit of it, 30 summit percent, is Oncidium, oh, how do I say this, Leucocillum. Cochillum. It's got a C-O-C-H in the middle of it, which being Latin, there's probably a set way to pronounce that. Um, anyway, that's a cool grower. This is a cool growing Oncidium, so that's a component part of Shari Baby. Um, Fragrant, blooms not exactly spectacular, certainly not very large um, component part number one. The next component part is something most people will have at least heard of, which is Sotoannum. <clears throat> now this is more temperature tolerant, but it's a type of Oncidium that comes from a place where it would get quite a distinct winter rest. It comes from a place where the winters are quite dry. Um, and it's an oncidium that I can vouch for if you haven't got reasonable temperatures, proper intermediate temperatures, not the lower end, and you don't keep it drier in winter, you will lose your roots. They will rot. It likes that dry winter rest. It's built into its makeup. And then the final component part is orthocrene. Green, oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. I mean, C R E N E, Crenny, Cream, I don't know. Anyway, that's a warm to hot growing Oncidium, <laughs> not a resting type. So we've now got the three component parts we've got a cool grower, temperature tolerant but likes a dry winter rest, and a warm to hot grower. But what are you going to do with that then? You've looked up the component parts to try and establish how to look after your Shari baby. Well, I've always said, go down the middle. If in doubt, go down the middle. So what would you class as going down the middle? Well, intermediate, yes. I suspect that was part of the goal, was to get a more temperature tolerant, you know, plant with some nice fragrant blooms. That was probably the goal of the, of the original cross. And, um, and it succeeded, Shari Baby is classed as an intermediate grower. And the other thought was, um, well, we'd like some fragrance on the blooms. Probably not that fussed what the blooms look like, given the component parts. I, I wouldn't class any of those blooms as spectacular, attractive in some sense, I suppose. But nonetheless, they achieved their goal. I don't think anybody would say that the blooms on Shari Baby are sensational to look at. They're okay, and it can produce some very large branching spikes with a huge number of blooms on. That part of it's a bit spectacular perhaps, but the actual colours and shape is, they're okay. They're not special until the fragrance hits you. And that is very, very special. Who would have thought that these fragrant Oncidiums and their fragrance is described as like, you know, honey fragrance, vanilla, um, spicy, lots of weight, fruity, 
lemon scented, all of these types of fragrances are based on natural things that occur naturally and that's how you associate the fragrance of a plant, is comparing it with something in the natural world. Well chocolate don't really come into it does it? Who would have thought that the cross would produce <coughs> blooms that smell of chocolate and they really do smell of chocolate and it's strong. Some people say it tends towards vanilla, um, some say vanilla chocolate, but most have got the chocolate element in their description of the fragrance. So uh, yeah, a strange result and I bet that was unexpected. <laughs> now my plant, um, I suspect this could have done with being kept a bit drier in the winter. Now what would have happened? Well, we've got new growths pushing up here and here. If I hadn't fed this and kept the water low, what would have happened to the new growths? The chances are nothing. They'd have carried, carried on as normal as though nothing had happened because of the size of the old bulbs. There's so much goodness in these old bulbs that those new growths would have been able to grow and the plant would have batted an eyelid. So it could have gone all winter with no feed and it still would have progressed these growths. But only because of the size and plumpness of the existing bulbs. Yeah? So that would have um, complied with the Soto Annum dry winter rest type requirement, if you know what I mean. Um, probably would have been better to split the difference and keep the watering low with an occasional feed and let these new growths take some of their nutrients from the plant um, and just keep my eye on the bulbs and make sure they don't start you know shriveling right in but you know even the really old bulbs on here are, are big so um, there's plenty of goodness in this plant in the older parts of the plant so uh, anyway it has bloomed for me um, I don't get such a strong chocolate fragrance anymore in this place because I don't get that flash of sun through the shading that seems to trigger it. So uh, anyway that's my version of the plant. Um, last time I repotted it I split it and the other half promptly died. It never made it. It just didn't recover from the repot. Whereas this one got going quite well, produced a mass of roots in the pot and is now pushing up some new growths that are heading towards maturity but they you know they haven't they haven't grown their bulbs yet, they're just pushing their leaves up at the moment. So that's that one, number four. Okay, and the last one, number five, Paphiopedalum Blackjack. And this got five votes. So you can see the votes are dropping down at a fair rate. You know, we've gone from nine down to five in the first five selected orchids. So when we get to the next five, will be dropping down to anything with more than one vote I think and then after that we might be down to my selection of those that got one vote <laughs> we shall see um, now Paphiopedal and Blackjack is a complex hybrid and quite honestly in the Paphiopedal and world many hybrids are complex yeah now I was told many many years ago that Paphiopedalums don't lend themselves to being cloned which is why they can be very expensive because they can only be produced by division or seed. Now I don't know whether that's actually true or not and whether some are actually cloned. Um, at the time I got this from Burnham's I think they probably had two dozen yeah all in bloom um, and that's just at one nursery. They were also for sale in other places. They were around, which implies to me that they were cloned to get that sort of number almost flooding the market, you could say. Um, anyway, I managed to get two spikes on here, both with double blooms. Now, one of the component parts that, that's gone into this rather complex hybrid is prone to producing two blooms on a spike but not the others, um, so that, that was quite good. Um, right, so this is also um, 
as a Pafio pedalum goes, one of the best root systems I've ever seen on a PAF. You may beg to differ, but I'm well pleased with that. Most of those roots I've grown, it had some when I repotted it, but then it just shot out another load of roots and sort of wrapped themselves all around that pot. Right, so what have we got in this one then? Um, we've got about 60% is Colossum. Now this is found, this is all um, the Far East Pathiopedalum, so we're looking at that part of the world again, same as Dendrobiums, over, over that side of the world. Um, and this is basically Thailand, Laos, all those sort of places. And it comes, that particular um, species, comes from humid, shady places. So it's a shade lover. And when we're talking about Pathiopedalums and it says shady, Take it with a pinch of salt, yeah? You know, we are looking at places like Thailand and Laos. So what they would call shady, we might call medium light. So I wouldn't go too mad on the old shading element of this plant. But it comes from, grows in soil that, it's terrestrial mainly, grows in soil that are high in silicates, or it grows on granite and sandstone. Um, mainly as a terrestrial or semi-terrestrial. Um, that is well over half of the contents of blackjack. Um, it's one of those that if you go down to the original species, it doesn't make any sense. But if you work up in orchid roots, if you work up, you start coming across hybrids that have gone into this, that have got the name red three or four of the hybrids involved have, have you know, been named something red. So it's pretty obvious that when you get to blackjack, <laughs> the amount of element that's gone into it to get the deepest possible colour becomes obvious. Um, now, the next one that's 30% is um, Lorenzianum, so I can't read my own writing. That, that's about 30% of the hybrid. And that comes from Borneo. So we're now back on the equator. Yeah? One of the um, islands, central islands through the um, equatorial zone. And this grows on limestone or in leaf litter. So again, it's a ground dweller. It's not up in the trees or anything like that. And it's a warm grower. Yeah? So... That's why I'm just trying to read the next thing that I've written. Right, that's all right. <laughs> My writing is atrocious and I wrote it. I didn't write it that long ago. Um, I couldn't read the word cross. <laughs> it looked like crom. <laughs> Two S's, you see. Anyway, the, the top cross that went into the final version, Blackjack, is Paphiopedalum Black Cherry and Paphiopedalum laser. So you could actually look up those two in somewhere like orchid roots and see what went into them. But it's the complexity down below that final cross. That final pair that went into making blackjack, are com their component parts is quite complex. So, um, so what, have you en what do you end up with? It's difficult to say and it often is with Paphiopedalums. Where are we? So we've got over half the plant likes soil with a lot of silicates in, which is basically ground up granite and limestone and sandstone and stuff like that. Um, mainly grows on the ground as a lithophyte, so on rocks or within leaf litter within those rocks, that sort of thing, and quite likes, you know, in terminology of all the orchid world in the wild quite shady and humid atmospheres so um, and then the other one comes from more open places but again you know grows on limestone or leaf litter so what do you pot it in then you tell me <laughs> mine's in bark and perlite with some I think it's got some chopped up sphagnum moss in it uh, did I put moss in that if I did there's not much in there well, there is some, but I would say the majority of that mix is small bark and perlite and 
I don't think the plant objects to the mix it's in. So I'm happy that that mix for that plant will remain and not get changed. I see no point in changing the media on that. I mean changing its component parts, not repotting. Um, the fact that it's got sphagnum moss in it and Paphiopedalums hate stale media. They're one of the few orchids where it is said, it is written in the scrolls, that they quite like being repotted. They like fresh media, but they have got fragile roots. They look quite sturdy, um, <coughs> but they can break relatively easily, so you do have to go careful with them, especially trying to force them into a pot. Um, now this one hasn't filled the pot yet. It's um, how many new growths have we got on here? There's one one tucked up in there. There's this one here, um, and then there's another one here. So there's three new growths coming on it, and all three growths have got room. This bit here in this pot is plenty big enough for the next three growths to fill. When they have filled that area, then it will get repotted but not until. I don't see any point in disturbing that, it's happy. And lovely patterned leaves. There are Paphiopedalums with plain leaves. There are some whoppers, as I call them, you know, that, that are like this wide with great big long strappy thin leaves, relatively thin compared with these. Um, they don't tend to be patterned, they tend to be plain green. Um, and this has particularly dark leaves with a lovely purple underside so this is an attractive plant even when it's not in bloom which really is what attracted me to it so uh, anyway so that's that one um, temperature wise most paphiopedalums it is said those with the patterned leaves like to be a bit warmer than those with the greener leaves I suspect there's variety within both of those types of statements. In other words, I suspect there's some with the greener leaves that actually are quite warm growers and I suspect there's some with patterned leaves that are cooler growers. But you've really got to just try and find out what's gone into your hybrid and see whether the average nut plants that have gone in there are up the warmer end or the cooler end and, and make your judgment accordingly. A lot of paths like a, a more alkaline media than a lot of other orchids and a lot of that is you know growing on limestone rocks or where there's runoff from limestone rocks so they might be growing on the forest floor but the water that's coming into that area has come off of the limestone rocks so you know it's more alkaline it would become more acidic as it went through the leaf litter and everything but um Yes, and, and others that just grow in forest areas in amongst the leaf litter and stuff like that would probably like a more acidic media. So again, it's, you've got to find out before you start making judgments and chucking alkaline materials over all of your paphiopedalums when some of them might grow on the forest floors. So go steady. Don't make rash decisions based on uh, ancient runes. Try and do a bit of research. So there we go. That's the five plants. Okay, so there we go. So that's the style of these videos. A spotlight on five plants, one after the other, making, I suspect, a video that's far too long. I have a large number of people that like the long videos. Well, here's one for you. And rather than an individual spotlight, if you think about it, total variety in that selection but you chose them I didn't choose them you chose them I've just put them together and I hope you've enjoyed it they are a bit fiddly to put together these videos um, with the various pop-ups typing the names in putting the pictures up all that sort of stuff they do take a bit of putting together but I'm happy to do that as long as people enjoy them if you're not subscribed, please do so. <laughs> Keep saying this. And don't forget to hit the like button if you've enjoyed the video. And if you've got anybody else that you know that might be interested in this video, you can always share it. Yeah? So, um, there we go. And I'll see you. That wind is just...
Have I still got a fence? Yeah, just about. It's moving here and there. Yeah, there's a, quite a strong wind going over. Now tomorrow we've got more rain coming in, but the wind's going to quieten down a bit. So, so, so we'll have the noise on the roof rather than an outside blasting all the leaves and trees and bushes around. Relatively speaking, this garden is quite sheltered where it's positioned because the wind comes in from over there and hits the house and goes up over the top and round. So it doesn't come in. Um, when we get a north wind, it comes straight in through that gap. But, but that happens very, very rarely. Most of our strong winds are south round to westerlies and that's that side of the house so it hits things before it gets to my garden and uh, softens it up a bit or lifts it up over the top anyway see you next time thanks for dropping by